I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and authority. As he approached the earth, his, patient, his presence bathed the whole world in brilliant light. I was told that this angel had been sent from God to give his final message with power one last time. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, before you are caught by her charms. Come out of her before you are before you begin to share in her sins and thus receive her plagues. Her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. She will be treated just, just as she treated others. Let her drink from her own cup. Let her receive equal to what she has done. Today I'd like to share with you one of the latest events of fulfilled prophecy. Now you just read, or you did, if you didn't read it, you heard it read, Revelation chapter 18, the last call out of Babylon, the last invitation to the world worldwide and with this last invitation, it's going to bring worldwide decision. And when worldwide decision is complete, there's going to be two groups. One group will be the folk that have decided to honor God. Everything will be clear. And the biggest issue, by the way, is the Sabbath. God's law are the law of Babylon. You see, the Sabbath has been put aside to represent and emphasize God's power. Sunday has been put aside and to emphasize the supreme power recognition of the papacy. You will have the opportunity, and most of you have already made your choice, if not all of us here, but you will have the opportunity to, in a big way, to share this of, with the world. I'm not sure where God's going to tell you where to go, but when the latter rain starts, you'll be sharing the truth about God asking people to come out of Babylon. Now Babylon will be made up of the false churches that have joined the papacy. The Bible calls that the, the harlot daughters along with the CEOs of the world. Now, what are the CEOs? The merchants are the, the Bible calls them merchants. Because Babylon is a, the papacy will have made a contract, an agreement like a marriage agreement with the kings and presidents of the nations of the world. That's one power. Another power is even stronger are the merchants. In fact, in the last verse of Revelation chapter 18, it says it's by the merchants that the whole world is being deceived. They're the ones that put this whole thing together in the end. And so what does this paper say my wife gave to me? Well, it's an announcement. Capitalism and Catholicism on Tuesday, December 8, as some of the world's biggest businesses and investment leaders announced a new partnership with Pope Francis. How many picked that up on the news this last month? One. You just missed one of the greatest, latest fulfillment of the signs of the end. So we have these great CEOs that went to, the, to Rome 
signed a contract with the papacy. They include Johnson & Johnson, CO, Bank of America, others from not only of America, but all around the world. And they signed a contract that they would meet with the papacy at least once a year. And they have a plan of what they're promoting. And one of these CEOs, and I quote, the fact that different religions need to come together on all matters is just the crying need of the times of the world. Are you ready to come together on all matters with all the religious organizations? Faith cannot be used to pull us apart. Faith is meant to bring us together. So we have this call out of Babylon. Come out of her, my people. And let's read it again. Turn to Revelation chapter 18. Let's again notice what makes up Babylon. It says, after these things, after what things? Well, this is an interesting expression that's used in two or three chapters in uh, the book of Revelation. Because we have vision after vision given to John, and John gives it to us. And remember, where did the visions come from? In Revelation chapter 1, it says, God gave it to who? Any of you remember? To Jesus. And Jesus gave it to who? To an angel. And he put it in coded form. It says he signified it or put it in coded form. And he gave it to who? John. And John wrote it out and gave it to who? Us. And so this is the different visions that John received. He wrote it out and gave it to us. But every once in a while, there would be this expression that we find in chapter 18. After these things I saw. After what things? Well, Revelation 17 and 18 are together. And in Revelation 17, we're told about a pro progression of powers that would ri arise to fight the gospel particularly arising with the papacy in 508 when she got all of the nations of Europe to sign an agreement of, of supporting her. Now she just got on December 8th, 2020, the CEOs of the world to sign that agreement. But she got the nations to sign the agreement in 508, now the first nation to assign, degree, assign, to assign an agreement was what nation? That was France in 508. And by 538, the 10 nations of Europe had signed that agreement. I call it like a marriage. You know, why, why do I call it a marriage? Be, because it says the papacy is sitting saying, I'm no longer a what? Remember that? In chapter, I think verse 9 of chapter 18, I'm no longer a, a widow. In other words, she was married to the European countries at an agreement from 538 to 1798, 1260 years. But in 1798, there was a divorce. She no longer had their support. Now, was she dead? No. She was divorced. Now, I had the privilege about three months ago, I, one of my homes that I, I, I own, I, I, had, I have this gentleman I rented it to, and, and uh, he lost his wife. But he had been married before. And exactly 50 years ago, he got a divorce. 
he got married when she was 17 and he was 21 and they had a couple kids, three kids and and uh, then uh, they were young and he went off to war and different things and and it didn't work out so they got a separation. And he, he says, the worst thing I ever did. I had pride, I got mad and, and I, I did a foolish thing. Well, I want to tell you something that those three kids worked fast when he didn't have his wife anymore. And they, they came to see him and brought their mother with them. Well, he and their, and their mother had been divorced for 50 years. And so one thing led to another and I remarried them. And now they live next door to me. <laughs> After 50 years, They're remarried. I just was wondering, do you think God was happy with that? Because does God like to bring peace? I want to tell you, the children are happy. Everybody's happy. They're so happy they want to buy that home, so I probably will sell it to them. But you see, the papacy is happy too. Now, you see, the European countries basically all divorced the papacy in 1798. Oh, the papacy's still alive. Well, they say, well, she got the Vatican back in 1929. That means they remarried. They never remarried in 1929. She just got her home back, that's all. Didn't get their support. And the rather interesting thing is in 1982, the power that made the papacy fall, a ideology power, which was basically atheism evolution, the Pope and President Reagan got together and worked together to make that power fall. And so basically in December of 1991, uh, the uh, Russian power, as far as promoting communism, fell. And even Gorbachev lost his position. And the mayor of Moscow took over. But the interesting thing is, in 1982, the 10 European countries of Europe redeveloped diplomatic relations with the papacy. The papacy now had a signed contract with the kings of Europe. There were four kings of Europe. They're considered the four Protestant countries, over 50% Protestant. Can any of you name one or two of them? Sweden. What, Sweden? Denmark. Denmark? England? What's the other one? No, Germany is not, is, is way less than 10% Protestant. Norway. Now those countries help, uh, you know, uh, during the Reformation, they help create uh, that divorce that finally happened in 1798. And they all four in 1982 after the other six countries had already redeveloped uh, these diplomatic relations, the last four came on board in 1982, and they were the four that helped very strongly in the Reformation, and they were the four Protestant countries. So in 1982 is when they, she got her husband back. Now that doesn't mean she was out persecuting right away, but she was some. And the point is, you had Babylon the Great being redeveloped or being developed in the last days. Now remember, when the papacy got a separation, was it with the whole world in 1798 or was it with just Europe? Just Europe. So she got her 
Marriage was just Europe's support in 1982, finalized. And then with that, working with Reagan in 1982, they began, they, they got the, you know, the wall open, Berlin. And in 1982, in November, Reagan appointed an ambassadorship from the nation which were the sons and daughters of Europe. What nation was that? America, 1982. The ambassador that was sent wasn't appointed to be sent until February of 83, but the decision by the Congress to appoint an ambassador was in November of 82. And Ellen White says, you don't count when you send an ambassador, you count when the nation votes it. So not only was, did Europe develop that relationship with the papacy, so did the nation, which was the sons and daughters of Europe. Now, as you, we can continue this thought, it says in, in Revelation 18, after these things, I saw another angel. Back to that again. After what things? Well, after the things of Revelation 17. And Revelation 17 says five of those seven powers that start with Babylon, made of Persia, Greece, Rome, the papacy, are fallen. And one is, and the other is yet to come. And how long will it last? Anybody remember? A short time. Five are fallen, one is, and the others to come will last, will last a short time. Well, these seven powers are powers that Satan uses to fight the gospel. And they're always, whatever power takes over puts down the power before. So the first power to develop that Daniel Revelation talks about always starts with Babylon and Babylon was the first nation to take Palestine away from, from what we would call, some people call the Jews or God's people at that time. So when Babylon fell, who took over control of Palestine? Well, the power that made Babylon fall and what power was that? Medo-Persia. And when Medo-Persia fell, who took over control of Palestine? Well, the power that made Medo-Persia fall, that was Greece. And when Greece fell, who took over the control of Palestine? Well, the power that made Greece fall, and that was Rome. And then Rome divided up into the 10 kings of Europe and, and they gave their support and then a marriage to the Bishop of Rome. Bishop of Rome, there are a lot of bishops out there. They, well, we're, I'm the most powerful bishop, so I'm the bishop of bishops, so call me the Pope. And that became the, the power that Satan uses to fight the gospel. Each one of those powers Satan used to fight the gospel. And then as we got up to 1798, an ideology that, that made the papacy fall, it was the French Revolution, atheism, evolution. And it, it man, before long it took over almost half the world at least. China, Russia, Eastern Europe and other countries. But in 1982, the Pope and the Reagan worked together and by 1991, uh, basically, at that time, the head of this power, Russia, fell. Even Gorbachev had to leave office. Yeltsin took over mayor of, of uh, Moscow. Well, again, after these things, it says in Revelation 18.1, after what? After the present of 17, fiber fallen, one is, the other's not come. Chapter 18 starts talking about not the first five kingdoms, not the one that is, but it starts talking about the other that's yet to come. And so chapter 18 talks about the seventh power and the eighth head, or the eighth power. Because it says in Revelation 17, Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. You can look at verse 10. 
And when he, continue, when he comes, he'll continue for a short period. Okay, there's the seven. But then in verse 11, the beast that was, that's the papacy, and is not, well, you see the papacy lost his marriage, but he's still alive, so it's no longer a beast power. Now, what is a beast power? A beast power is a power that persecutes. So from 1798, basically, to, to our time, but it, actually the papacy has been involved in a little persecution before our time, but basically it did not have the power to persecute because it had no husbands to, to fight for her to do the persecuting. You see, the papacy during the Dark Ages used the kings of Europe to do the persecuting. So the beast that was and is not, even he is the what? Verse 11, you remember it? He's the eighth and is of the what? The seventh. But it goes into uh, to perdition. So the beast that was, the papacy during the Dark Ages, will become the eighth power af after number seven, or with number seven, actually. But it goes into perdition. Total destruction. And so again, Revelation 18, 1, after these things, what it's saying in verse 18, or chapter 18, now we're going to talk about the seventh head with the eighth power. It's after we've, we've talked up already about fire and fallen, one is, that's present, that's, that's, where we were, that's where we were living during my lifetime. Now, I mentioned a month or so ago to you that I got married in 1962 and still married the same girl. And Lord blessed in a beautiful way. But in 1962, the papacy had less than five diplomatic relations with five countries. During my 58 years of marriage, the papacy has more diplomatic relations with more countries than any other nation in the world. Because the papacy is a nation too, you know that. She's developed more diplomatic relations with more countries than any other, more than the United States. And with those diplomatic relations, each time she gets more power. And so then it starts in chapter 18 to describe a time, our time today, when Babylon is basically totally formed. She has, she's, Babylon is made up of the kings of Europe, which has already happened. And it's, it's also made up with the nations of the world, which hasn't quite happened. Because who's going to make the nations of the world honor the papacy? Do you remember? United States. Now, we could run back there and read that verse. The two-horned beast. I want you to read it later. But you need to notice something important. It says in chapter 13, the second half, First half talks about the seven-headed beast. The second one talks about the two-horned beast. In the second half, it says that two-horned beast is going to cause all the world to honor the papacy. Now, this is the word that nobody reads. Whose deadly wound is already healed. So, when the United States causes all the world to honor the papacy... Her divorce with Europe is already healed. She's already remarried. That's what it says. She's already remarried, and she she was remarried in 1982. Now, the United States to make I'm sorry, the uh, Babylon to be fully formed has to have the kings of Europe as well as an the whatever you want to call the presidents, the rest of the world supporting, countries supporting her. That hasn't totally happened yet. Now she does have 
diplomatic relations, but let's take America. America would have to change its constitution, hasn't done it. But it says America will cause the rest of the countries to do it after she does it. So it hasn't quite happened the countries of the world. Europe has happened in this last month, for uh, 29 days ago, the, the CEOs of the world have done it because Babylon is also made up of the merchants of the world. This just happened. So it says here, during in on our time, this messenger, this angel is a messenger. Now remember, God gave a message to Jesus, who gave it to the angel, who put it in coded form, who gave it to John, and John gave it to us. In this message of Revelation 18, those first five or six verses, there's another message that God gave to Jesus. And Jesus gave it to the angel who put it in gold form. And the angel gave it to John and John wrote it for us today. This is for you and I. This is those Adventists that are alive today. We're to go out with that message and say, come out of her, my people, right? Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and you won't receive her plagues. And so God is inviting you to go out and give this message. Now a message in the Greek here, is, the word angel means messenger and a message. And so that comes to us for us to go out. And so soon the latter rain, and I don't know how soon, and, but we know it's soon, is gonna happen. And God's people, they're talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church will be used in a special way now you take this Peter who had not much education, became a great preacher. The fun sermon to, pre, uh, to, to give for me on, on Acts chapter two and Acts chapter three and four. This, this uneducated person, thousands of people saved in a day. God's gonna use the Adventist people who are preparing in the same way. And they're going to do miracles. Now, again, I've mentioned this before. You can read about it. Go to chapter 38 in, in uh, Great Controversy. And Ellen White says it talks about the latter rain. And it says, particularly the last few pages of that chapter, that we'll be going out uh, with a Bible in our hand, by the way. Not a dupe. Some of you remember the DuPont projectors and all the other things. We're going to go out with a Bible. And, and God's going to give us power to do miracles. And Jesus told his disciples that they'll do more miracles than he did. And Ellen White says we'll do more miracles than they did. But we're not doing the miracles. And, you know, it was rather interesting. God sent the disciples out, first to 12, and Matthew 10, then Luke 10, the 70. And uh, they felt pretty good. Even the, the demons uh, were subject to us. He even gave them power that says to raise the dead. But, you know, they went out and did a little bit. But after they had a conversion, Jesus died on the cross. And then 50 days later, they had that conversion. Then they went out and boy, did it spread like wildfire. And they weren't coming back, look what we did. You know, they were realized they were being used by a power greater than them. They used they didn't have the ability or the spirituality. God did something special. So soon the latter rain is coming and you're gonna be used that way, maybe. Now we're living in right now, and I, I, I was really interested in a sermon that Dwight Nelson preached last Sabbath. And you might want to go home and look it up and, and, and listen to it. And I'm going to share a few texts and a few comments that he made and add to them. 
Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would come to a time of darkness where the great he would be the light. And of course he was the light of the world. And then he says he wants us to be the light. Well, when the latter rain starts, there's going to be two groups of Adventists. One, Dwight Nelson suggests that during this time of darkness, this pandemic, when many people can't do the things they used to do because we're not, there's, a lot of the events are not happening, we have to stay home more. What are we doing when we stay home? Maybe it's the iPad, maybe it's games, maybe we're watching movies, maybe we're doing all kinds of things. Or are we taking this time to develop a closer relationship with Jesus? Are we taking this time to study the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? Are we taking this time to pray for our family, our neighbors? And we can't even go visit our neighbors. And, and, and the longer we pray and the longer that we study, we're getting all excited, ready to jump, but we can't jump. You know, my uh, daughter has a dog and we've helped take care of it some, so every time it sees me, it goes nuts. But my, da my daughter says, stay, stay. And then, boy, he's just ready to go. And as soon as she says, you can go, boom, he runs to me. And well, we're, we're, we're during this pandemic time asked to stay. Some of us don't, you know, it's possible that some Seventh-day Adventists aren't all that worried they're doing all kinds of things. They make up things. Maybe they're watching old movies. But others are praying and studying and, and, and getting all excited to jump. And, and then the latter rain is going to come and boom, out we go. Now, when that happens, there's going to be two groups. The five wise virgins, that's what Dwight Nelson says, and the five foolish. The five wise have been studying and praying and they have oil in their lamp. And the five foolish haven't taken any time for anything spiritually. And when that time comes, when the latter rain starts, the Adventist probation closes. Those that didn't take the time, their future is sealed. Those that took the time, their future is sealed as well. And then those that took the time will be used in a glorious way. Others will be, the Bible in the Spirit of Prophecy talks about the lukewarmness and the leaving of the church. And some of them are members, some of them are pastors, some of them are conference directors. And those that are used, some of them are members, some of them are pastors, some of them are conference directors. You have two groups. The fate of both groups has been decided. And so this group that has, can be used by the Holy Spirit, they zip out. They're used in a glorious way. How long? I don't know. How long is this going to last? Well, there's some interesting things that you can consider, but... This is not gospel, but something to consider. How long was Elijah in, on the mountain being provided for, doing miracles and preaching? Three and a half years. Interesting, isn't it? How long was Jesus preaching and doing miracles and being persecuted? How long? Three and a half years. And then the disciples started at Pentecost and to AD 34, three and a half years. You can even take uh, Queen Esther's experience, three and a half years. Uh, you take the Dark Ages experience, three, three and a half prophetic years. Well, that's something to consider. We don't, you know, it's, can't say thus saith the Lord on that, but that's interesting. But whatever time it takes for the latter rain to do its, its uh, work, where everybody in the world comes to a decision. And again, you have those on this side 
that accept God's sovereignty and the, and the mark of his authority, Sabbath, and those on this side that accepts the world's authority and mark, then probation closes. You have two groups again. So where do I want to be? Where do you want to be? Now the nations of the world have not at this time been forced or been called to support the papacy like the Bible says it will happen by the United States. But one group that's supposed to be part of it is the merchants. And the merchants signed their contract on December 8th. It's almost time for the latter rain to fall. It's almost time for the United States to cause the rest of the world to support the countries to support the papacy. Now, Revelation 17, seven heads. So it says five are fallen. Well, that's Babylon, Mena, Persia, Greece, uh, Rome, and the papacy. One that was, well, that was the papacy during the Dark Ages, past. One is, that's our time right now. Uh, it was atheism evolution that caused the philosophy that caused uh, during the French Revolution, the papacy to fall. And so the papacy, you notice, under head number six, it was divorced from the European nations, 1798. And at the same time, the United States arose with a separation of church and state and freedom of worship. But then there's number seven head, and number seven head is the United States. You remember what it said in Revelation 13? It would rise like a lamb, but it would speak as a what? Now between those two phrases, almost 200 years, rise like a lamb, speak as a dragon. If you go back to Revelation 13, the first couple verses, it talks about the rise of the papacy. Then it said, his deadly wound, it would have a deadly wound, but his deadly wound would be healed. So the papacy from the time he gets his deadly wound till it's healed is about 200 years. So between those two phrases is 200 years on both of those. And so the papacy was divorced in 1798 and the United States came up at the same time, approximately. And then the other that is not yet come, future, when the United States fully supports the papacy by doing away with this constitution and changing it and getting the rest of the world to support it. So when that happens, the United States under head number six, on head number seven, then there's a marriage of church and state in the United States. And then there's freedom of worship denied. Revelation 13, seven to, seven to eight talks about that. And then the papacy as well, and I put down was remarried to the European nations in 1982. And it was partnered with the merchants now the papacy is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Now the United States is about ready to change its constitution and then causes the whole world to worship the papacy whose deadly wound is already healed with Europe. And then the eighth power will reign with the seventh head. So the eighth power is Babylon the Great, it's papacy and her daughters and merchants and the kings of and nations of the world. That's Babylon, the eighth power. The 10 kings, it says that then receive power as kings one hour with the papacy. Now, how long is one hour? 15 days. And the, the 10 kings give their power and together they make war with who? The lamb. Now when they make this direct war with the lamb, the lamb doesn't take much time and 15 days is over. 
And the lamb then overcomes the eighth power. And the beast goes into what? Are you with me? Total destruction. And so I wrote that verse down there. There are seven kings. Note, five are fallen. One is, the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he continues a short time. And how long is a short time? Uh, it's, well, it, it emphasizes a short time. Not whatever time that is, it's going to be very short. Well, we know that it says one hour when they, in the end, that's only 15 days. And the beast that was and is not, he was the eighth and he is of the seven. And he goes into perdition. So the, the eighth power is a papacy, not just with the kings of Europe, but with the whole world and kings and nations and with the merchants of the whole world and it only lasts one hour and goes into perdition now let's go over uh, to chapter 18 which is on the right hand side of the page and I put a little note on the top Satan is a dragon Revelation 12 9 says that and each head is a power or nation that Satan uses to fight the gospel and I put a note there, Babylon the Great is composed of who? Well, the papacy. She says, I sit as a queen and I am no longer a widow. Her harlot daughters are Protestant Sunday keeping churches. All nations and kings, they live deliciously because of this arrangement. They, they have a reason for doing this. Uh, the, the merchants, uh, by doing this, they, they wax rich, it says. Number four. And number five, all the people who are not with the Lamb. And it says in verse 1823, you know, the merchants were the great men of the earth, for by their sorcerers were all nations deceived. They're, they're putting this together for their own benefit. And then I go on down to the next uh, area, and I, I put a little note there in the top. Note, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. Chapter, Revelation is uh, chapter 17, verse 3. That's down to our time. And so John is taken to our time in earth's history. And he saw a woman sit on a spotted colored beast. And, and then it, this is future. Revelation 18, the eighth power. Revelation 18, 1 says, there's a message from Christ with great power and glory to all the world. And the message is, Babylon the Great has fallen. This is part of the latter rain message that God's people will give. And the message is that all nations and kings have committed fornication with her. And the message is that all the merchants of the earth are waxed rich because of her. And there's a warning to God's people in all of the other organizations and what is that warning? Come out of her, my people. Because in verse 7, the papacy says, she's, I now am remarried. I now am a queen, not just of Europe, but the whole world. And all I have all the support of all the merchants as well, and the merchant marines. The merchant marines are supporting me too. And she says, I am no longer a, a widow. But what happens immediately? The papacy is utterly burned with fire and judgment comes in one hour, 15 days. The kings of the earth will be well of, for her judgment comes in one hour. The merchants weep because they cannot sell their merchandise anymore and, her, and it says that her judgment comes in one hour. The merchant marines, those are the uh, people that move uh, products around the world by ship and and also, you could say, by extension, by trucks and whatever. The merchant marines, they weep because they cannot trade anymore and make money. Because she's destroyed, it says, one hour. And what's the next thing that happens? Verse 21, the Daniel 2 stone, the stone of Daniel 2, then destroys Babylon. Who's Babylon? Well, Babylon is the papacy, the heart of dollars, the kings and nations of the world, the merchants of the world, the merchant marines and the people. Babylon is destroyed. Daniel 2 talks about the remnant of the wicked being destroyed with that stone. 
both stones in both places is a, everything is is just destroyed to smithereens nothing left and it says then that babylon shall be found no more and then, and then the next the last few verses says there won't be any more entertainment there won't be any more crafts there won't be any more millstone you know that's farming there won't be more energy the light of a candle our marriages you see, how can you have those things when everybody's dead? Can you have marriages? Can you have people farming? Lighting a candle? Can you have entertainment? Everybody's dead. So the earth is now desolate for how long? Now I put a quotation over to the left, a Bible verse on the bottom of the left. The same words are used in two or three places in the Old Testament. And I just put one quotation down, Jeremiah 25. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of myrrh, the voice of the gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones, the light of a candle. And this whole land shall be what? A what? A desolation. It was a desolation for 70 years when Nebuchadnezzar, and they pulled all these people out of Palestine. Can't have marriages and millstone noises and all this when there's no people there. So Revelation 18 uses those same words to describe the earth during the millennium. You got me? Now where are we today? We're on the verge of the last moments of time. How long will it take? Well, for whatever time it takes, for the latter rain to do its work it might be three and a half years but after that and go home and read chapter 39 of great controversy it says jesus then stands up and uh, he he's leaving the sanctuary and time no longer Every, he, everybody's made a decision it's over now how long it takes from the time of close of probation to the coming Jesus I don't know how much time that will take I do know that when I read chapter 39 there's several things that happen he stands up and then there's a great darkness that goes across the whole world and then Satan gets to do that thing of his the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even at the same time he gets to do that i don't know how long this is going to be but i don't know why he describes it tsunamis earthquakes fire volcanoes the economy going nowhere people hungry now up until probation closes some of god's people will suffer even death martyrism but when probation closes, when Jesus stands up, not one of God's people who's alive until he comes will die. There'll be some suffering, some in jail, some hunger. But she, she spends several couple pages on describing past times of how God took care of his people when they were in trouble with food and water. And he's going to do it again. Now, in closing, uh, and by the way, folk, I put down something here. I'm not the gospel of truth. You go home and study and pray and see what the Lord shares with you. Uh, your pastor, myself, we have all kinds of books on Daniel and Revelation we read. And then God inspires us. And uh, I want to tell you, to be real honest with you, as I've studied Daniel Revelation very intensively the last 30, 40 years, some things I thought 20 years ago, I realized I thought wrong. As more study, and so what's important is you study and you pray and you let the Holy Spirit guide you in your thinking. That's the important thing. But a couple quick the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shone. 
That was a prophecy in Isaiah 9-2 of the coming of Jesus upon this earth. And Matthew takes that same verse in Matthew 4-16. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, the light has dawned. Do you feel like that with this pandemic, you can't do anything, you can't go anywhere, you're just sitting? Do you feel like it's darkness now? Well, Dwight Nelson felt that way, and so I'm taking some of these thoughts from him. Last Sabbath, he preached this sermon. Only, I've just got a couple points of what he said. Great sermon. Upon those who set are, are upon those who are sitting in the region and the shadow of death, light has dawned. Not those who are walking, not living, but just sitting in the shadow of death. Do you find yourself in this pandemic not being able to go anywhere, just sitting? Is it darkness? The Bible foretold of our times, this culture of death that we're living in right now. Our news media speaks of death in this culture today. I read in a paper that 26 new people got the virus in, in Coos Bay yesterday and three more died. We're told to stay home. We don't go anywhere because death is everywhere. There is a pandemic out there. We must be careful or we might die too. You might die, I might die. Jesus' first coming was to a world, our culture of death. His second coming is the same. Jesus' first coming was to a world where there was no light. He brought the light. In him was life, John 1, 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. How many of your friends aren't realizing what's really going on right now? Do you? Have you thought about how you're going to spend your time? Is it going to be sitting doing nothing that will prepare you to be part of the latter rain? Or is it, are you going to decide to make some changes and be prepared? Jesus said, I'm the light of the world and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John 8, 12. And Jesus wants you and me to reflect this light in this culture of death. He's the sun, we are the moon. We're to reflect his light. Is it hard to be a light to others when we are required to stay home? We can't go to the restaurant. We can't go to the family gatherings. We can't go to sports events. We can't wait, I'm sorry, we can't visit our doctor or our dentist. And in some areas of the United States, we can't even take a walk down uh, the sidewalk in front of our house. All because of this pandemic, this COVID-19. This culture of death is driving us nuts. Many are living in small flats, no yard, no garden, no flowers. What are they doing with their time? Now, my wife and I are lucky. We have a neat backyard. I have a garden. I have flowers. I, I made a chicken coop for her three chickens. And uh, we have uh, two cats and two dogs. And we feed the, we feed the birds outside. And, she, and she's, a, she's an artist. And she got a degree in art. She's a teacher. She, uh, she does all kinds of things. And so she has something to do. But I know a lot of people stuck in a little flat, they don't have a view, and they have nothing to do. Driving lots of people nuts. Could it be that we're now living in the pandemic night waiting for the bridegroom to give us the latter rain? Are we one of the five wise virgins? Or are we one of the five foolish? Are we spending this time in this pandemic night taking advantage of this extra time for a closer walk with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. For most of us now, there's more time to pray and, and more time to study the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. There's more time to contemplate the love of God. 
Then when the bridegroom comes at the latter rain through the Holy Spirit, you will have oil in your lamp. Then when the pandemic is over, you will be a great light and with power and glory, you'll be part of the latter rain. The latter rain is when we give the last call to come out of Babylon. Is the close of probation near? Are we living in the final days of earth's history? While the bridegroom tarries, let us get ready. Now Ellen White says that the close of probation will close for Adventists before it closes for the rest of the world. Because when the latter rain comes, there's two groups of Adventists, those that are prepared and those that haven't. So probation closes for both groups at that time. The ten virgins are the SDAs of the last days and probation closes for the foolish SDAs when the latter rain begins. They did not use this time, the pandemic time, to prepare. Well, we are living in the last days. This is the time to take advantage of this pandemic night to fill our lamps so that we can shine bright with a great light of power and glory for Jesus during the latter rain. Let me sh share with you the latest fulfilled signs, and I already did. I already did. I want to close with two stories. Can God take care of us? Is he able to fill our needs? On the second, uh, third week, uh, second week of uh, February 2015, I'd received some money and I owed $600 tithe. And my wife and I, we put it in the tithe envelope and on our way to church, I said, you know, honey, and I talked a little business on Sabbath. I said, we could hold this off to the end of the month and I can pay, uh, this will help me pay my, my tax bill. And my wife is, of course, uh, the leader and everything good thing in my house. And she said, no. She says, we need to turn that tithe in. We got it, turn it in. So, you know, uh, I learned a long time ago, it's best to honor her. And uh, so I turned it in. That was Sabbath. Thursday, I got a letter in the mail, handwritten, handwritten address. Didn't recognize the name. Back in 1969, we sold our business. We sold our house. Uh, we sold several vehicles we own. I sold my airplane. And uh, we had one more year of college, but we went to Okinawa as student missionaries. And one of the vehicles I sold, and all the things we were doing, I, I forgot this guy never paid me. It was a, a, a Volkswagen van. You remember those Volkswagen vans? And here was this letter. He said, Pastor Stout, back in 1969, I got your van, I never paid you for it. Here's it, and there was a check for $1,800. Check for $1,800. 45 years later, five days after it turned into tithe for $600, I got three times as much in the mail. I got $1,800 instead of $600. Now, I could, as many of you can, can tell many stories where that has happened. You see, there's two experiences that, that draws closer to understanding that God will take care of us. One is to honor time that God calls holy, the Sabbath. And those that don't honor that, there's no reason for them to give a call out of Babylon because uh, if you don't honor the Sabbath, do you read the news on Sabbath? Uh, you go home and think about what you do on Sabbath. Do you prepare for the Sabbath? You know, when I got married, my wife and I prepared for that. She prepared the dress, she had her hair done, she had everything nice, I did the thing, same thing. Had all of our plans all figured out ahead of time. Do you do that for the Sabbath? But there's something else that uh, draws us close to God. And that is that when we return what blocks to Him, we are in business with Him. So in my business, in all these years, I've always had something going. Either I run the business or God and I run it. 
And God and I run it ways when I return the 10%. I don't pay tithe, I return it. That's when God runs it. And you know, when God runs it, I always have what I need. And I can tell you stories about just when I needed it, it was right there. Have you ever heard of what happened in 1933? God was ready the day that banks were closed. How many have ever heard that story? Any of you? It was 1933. Williams was the under treasurer of the General Conference. He'd been asking his secretary to put 10 $100 bills in an envelope, mark it, and put it in the safe at the General Conference. Nobody knew that this was happening but him and his under secretary underneath him, or his secretary underneath him. He was a keen financer. He understood the currencies of the land, of many lands, because it was his duty to send money to all the missionaries around the world. And you want to know, we had a lot of missionaries, more than we do now, back then. Funds were scarce and many people were going hungry. The world was, budget of the church had been cut at the annual meeting and a general feeling and concern prevailed. Elder Williams had charge of the flow of the denominational funds in and out of the General Conference with respect to both the World Phil and the North American Division. Because of this, he did his banking not only in Tacoma, uh, Tacoma Park, but also downtown Washington, D.C but also in New York City as well. This 1,000 amount that Elder Williams directed his secretary, Chester Rogers, to put into the office safe were funds he had withdrawn every so often from the General Conference account at the bank in Tacoma Park. Now his secretary wondering what was going on here. But he then on a Thursday, the day before that uh, Theodore Roosevelt was to be inaugurated as the president, in 1933, he asked his secretary to drive him to the Union Station in downtown Washington so that he could take the midnight train to an unscheduled trip to New York City. Of course, other Williams frequently went to New York City to arrange to send funds to the mission field once a month he cabled them, but this time it was a fully 10 days in advance of the date before a trip normally would have been given, or scheduled rather. A few days later in a regular morning chapel service at the General Conference, Elder Williams told the story, told the author, all, everybody in the General Conference what happened on that trip. It made a lasting impression on everybody's mind. It was closing time on March 2nd. People were rushing from home to work while I alone sat in my office, enjoying the quiet hush after a busy day. I didn't go home early, he said, because my wife wasn't at home, so I was just stayed in the office for a while. Suddenly he felt a pressure on his shoulder, and he heard a voice. Go to New York, to New York City tonight. I set up. I braced myself in my chair. Then I bowed my head and I prayed, Lord, I have no authority to transact business in New York City at this time. What am I to do when I get there? The pressure continued in the voice, go. I was tired. I dreaded a late night trip to the Union Station by streetcar. I wonder if my secretary was still here and he had, he was still there. So he asked the secretary to drive him down. And on, of course, uh, with the streetcar, he was on his way to New York City. And when he arrived, he prayed that the Lord would keep me from any improper transactions that day. Why am I here? Anyway, and as the morning advanced, the answer came. Go to two banks and send the mission money to each division. But this was too early in the month, I reasoned. However, there seemed to be no other way but to do what I was told to do. And when the banks opened that Friday morning, I found myself at the first bank. And, and to make a story, and make it a little shorter, 
uh, he, he, of course, knew this fellow, this fellow knew him, and, and he told him to send the, the, the amount that he always told him to send. The last moment he said, oh, by the way, he said three times as much. Fine, Mr. Williams, I'll be happy to take care of that for you. And after checking to be sure that he had uh, correct addresses, I gave him a list of the different amounts to send to each division. And that's when he said, in fact, I'd like to send three times our regular amount. And with his uh, business mind, he could tell there was, he was thinking there's enough in the bank to do that. Well, the, he asked him, I want you to do this right away. And the teller says, I'll do it right now, he says. Well, uh, when I had gone there that morning, I had been trembling so much that I could scarcely walk. But inside the bank, all my shaking and quibbling stopped and the fears had vanished. And out on the street, it, it came back. Again, I felt the pressure on my shoulder and I heard the words, go to the other bank and send those funds now. The voice sounded as though there was no time to lose. Again, I followed the instructions. At the second bank, I again met a nice reception and I transferred the, the mission funds in exactly the same manner. I had it to First Bank, not forgetting to caution the teller that the money should be call, uh, cabled at once. And receiving the same assurance that it would be, I left. The next step was clear to me. I must cable the division and say, conserve funds, all these different divisions. And, and I let her follow them. I, you know, Concerned the funds and, and letters will follow. Having attended to this, I suddenly realized that I was completely exhausted. Now, to make a story come to a quicker conclusion here because of time, he went back home. He was tired. It was now early Friday morning and he went to bed only to be wakened early in the morning. Read all about it, read all about it. The banks are closed all across America. And he of course wasn't tired anymore. He got up and read and, and uh, this was, oh, and this wasn't Friday morning, this was Sabbath morning. And so he, there was a, a call at the, by the treasurer of the General Conference to meet Saturday night. What are we going to do? We don't have money to bring the missionaries home. And so they, they met and they talked. And it's fun to read the story, but I'll make it quick here. And they, uh, he couldn't get a word in edgewise. And finally, people uh, kind of, you know, they were talking. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And he got his word in. And he told how the Lord told him. To send three months salary to every missionary. Although they were had a praise time and they they got their knees, they thanked the Lord. And then they said, But what are we gonna do about the staff here? Oh, he says, for several weeks I've been putting a thousand dollars a week in the safe. They couldn't go to the bank. They couldn't get any money out. So they went to the safe. They pulled those envelopes out. They counted it. And they said, well, we got the money to take care of us for three months. Particularly if we're careful. Well, some of you know the history. How long were the banks closed? Three months. Now, I'm asking you, as we go into that latter rain, we're told that persecution will start. And towards the end of the time, some of our people will be martyrs. Can God take care of us when we can't buy or sell? Can God give us strength if we're in jail or a martyr? Will we be taken care of? And what's the end game? Everlasting life. After a thousand years in heaven, we'll come down and after a little scrimmage, 
who have watched Jesus remake this world. It'll be like it was for Adam and Eve. And how long will you enjoy it? Forever and ever. I'd like to appeal to you folk to study God's word, to think about putting aside some of the things you don't need to do anymore, to have more time for prayer. We need help. We don't have the ability to overcome sin. We don't have the ability to forgive other people. We don't have the ability to stop doing something that he shows us we should stop doing. But if we pray, he'll give us that ability. His power, not our power. And wouldn't it be neat if as members of this church, you're all friends, that you could all be friends in the new earth? That all of you were taking time as you realize this pandemic is, you can either be wise virgins or foolish ones. And the wise will live on forever and ever and even forever and ever. You know, when Jesus comes, in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet will sound, and the dead be resurrected in perfect bodies. And in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, those of us who are still alive, we suddenly bang get perfect uh, bodies. You know, of course, around 25 to 28, we were, we were at our best. We'll be put back, only with no defects. Even when we were at our best, we had genes we were start, that would get old, that would decay. And they'll never decay. And instead we will grow. And we'll grow physically and we will grow intellectually. And, you know, study and study and study about nature and all the different things, it's going to be a real blessing. I want to be there, do you? The general surrounded Jerusalem was there nine days and left. All the, the Christians that believed and did what Jesus said as well and went to Paula. Not one Christian died when three and one half years later, Titus came back. Yeah, there's that three and a half year again. Titus came back. Millions of Jews were killed. And one, that first general surrounded Jerusalem and left. All the Christians that were listening to Jesus left. The other Christians stayed. Probation closed for both of those groups right then. The ones that stayed and didn't do what Jesus said died. They were lost. The ones that left lived and they were saved. I'm not sure exactly how things are going to come in the end, but I know one thing. Let us do what Jesus said. Father, we want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you for what you've given to us and, and words of wisdom and prophecy and how the Holy Spirit can guide us in our thoughts. And we want to thank you for the warnings. And we want to thank you that we know the end game. And we appreciate that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.